Well, doing my spirit was a little bit shorthanded this morning, but guys, nothing was missing. Thank you for leading us so well. You always do. Hey, everybody, it's the Sunday, it's the Sunday you've been waiting for. You know what Sunday it is? Not last week was Mother's Day. I'm not talking about that. Next week is Senior Recognition Day. And you guys go ahead and show the next slide up there, okay? Now, this is the Sunday you've really been waiting for, right? You have a little hint in your bulletin. It's Associational Missions Emphasis Sunday, the one that you've all been waiting for, right? <laughs> you, you hear the, uh, is that sarcasm I hear, you know, coming out of the preacher's mouth? But uh, it really is. You know, it's an honor for us to be counted among 42 other churches in our association of churches because you know what? Together, we can do more. And we do so. Brother Jimmy Garcia, he's preached here many times for you, and you know Jimmy. We're so thankful for his leadership in our association. And we do have, like all, all years, you know, to this Sunday that we look forward to, there's an emphasis, there's an associational emphasis. And this year's is that. Start something new. But God already beat us to that. He has already started something new in this church. And every Sunday morning when I'm here with you, I can sense the newness of a new time and a new day. So God has really already begun something new in this church. So that would have been redundant. And so I thought, you know, I made an executive decision uh, this week. And uh, I thought this should be maybe, next slide. Just walk across the street Sunday. Because this week I heard another fantastic story. It's actually the case. Every, every week I hear another story. And uh, Richard and Rose Eldridge, if you guys would make your way up here. Every week I hear another story of the way God has worked in your lives. And uh, so many times I'm hearing these stories and I'm thinking, I wish everybody had just heard that, you know. A few weeks ago, Roy and I got together. I thought after our visit, I wish everybody in our church would have been here for this conversation and to hear that. And so this week, you know, I got queued in on, if I know how to turn this on, we will be good. Uh, I think I turned a button anyway. Yeah, I think it's it working, works. Richard. This is Richard and Rose. And I just wanted you to hear, you know, a brief part of their story. Uh, first of all, how long have you guys been in Del Rio? This time since 1999. Okay, so good long while, but not forever. So right. where were you before you were in, where did you come from? We came from Anchorage, Alaska. Wow, cool. Yeah, and, uh, and you stayed. And we stayed. <laughs> wow. Unbeknownst to me, we stayed. That's... We came down on vacation and I didn't know it, but we went from the airport directly to Kay Lowe's office. Anybody who's been here any amount of time knows who Kay Lowe was. But uh, and so I've still got the suitcases in the trunk, and she had us out looking at houses. <laughs> Her and the daughter had been conniving. Wow, so Rose, had, Rose loves you and had a wonderful plan for your life that included Del Rio. Amen. And, well, you know... Isn't that interesting, the places we come from? When, when we were living in Canada, I was out at the shooting range one day, and a, you know, my accent always told on me, and a guy said, where in the world are you from? I said, I'm from Texas. And he asked why, and I told him, he said, you mean you left there for here? <laughs> and uh, that's the way some people may think. You left Anchorage for Del Rio, but you landed here well, didn't you? Amen. You really did. And, you know, there were, there's a key couple that had an important role to play in your lives when you got here. Many of you remember Joe and Anna Lugo. And so tell us how you guys met the Lugos and how that went. Well, we bought a home across the street from Joe and Anna, and uh, we were out. I don't remember what we were doing, but we were outside anyway. One Anna day. Anna out walking her dog. And she stopped and said hello to me, and I said hello. And we stopped and just chit-chatted, and uh, she said, did you just move here? And I said, yes. And she said, well, we did too. She says, tell me a little bit about your life here. She said, I'm, I might want to introduce you to our church that we go to. Wow, so she just walked across the street. 
But it's amazing that we have that on the screen. Just Aren't y'all impressed by that? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So she walked across the street and made friends with you guys, right? They certainly did. Yeah. Okay, and that involved, even from the start, an invitation to church, didn't it? It did. Okay, but it was really bigger than that, right? It was. Tell us about that, Richard. It, uh, well, if anybody knows Joe and Anna, quite a few of you do, you know that uh, once Joe gets a hold of you, he witnesses, and he don't stop. Mm -hmm. And we told him we were looking for a church that greeted you with a handshake and didn't have the other one out looking for all your money. He said, well, I think we found the one for you. Why don't you join us? Yeah. And we have never looked back. We have never been so loved uh, as we were when we came into this church. Uh, we were saved in this mm -hmm. church, and uh, Joe and Anna are still very dear friends, and mm -hmm. any time he comes by the house, he still witnesses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. But it wasn't an imposition, it sounds like to me. And so... For, for someone maybe who had just moved to Del Rio and, and uh, one of us were their across the street neighbor, what were some of the things about the way Joe and Anna got to know you guys that, uh, that really made it count? You know, you're standing here today, these years later, you're, you help lead in the uh, merely mature, I have to be careful, I don't say it the way Jean Ducharme does. Um, <laughs> And, and you're leaders, and you're contributing with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Uh, what was it about Joe and Anna that made that invitation one that you, you were able to respond to? It's just their love and their friendship. Yeah. It was, uh... And it was their family. You know, they uh, uh, had family over in uh, Victoria, and they had quite a bit of family come over and visit them. And we, uh, we loaned them our, uh, our, <laughs> our uh, things to lay on to sleep, you know, to uh, cover yeah. up with. And they, uh, we just made friends with them, too. Yeah. And to this day, we do. And became family with them. Yes. And with their family. Yes. Yeah. See, I told you, you know, some of you saw the little attempt at a commercial that I did for our church, a welcome. And you know, this is an example, isn't it? This church has some of the greatest people I've ever known. And I really do appreciate you guys coming and sharing that story with us because it makes it real. It gives all the rest of us hope that we can play a Joe and Anna role in somebody else's life too, okay? Amen. Thank, thank you, you for having us. You bet. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Rose, for doing this with us today. Yeah. Well, uh, that's really what we would like to talk about today, and we're going to do so with the biblical basis, and you can be turning to really one of the most famous chapters of the whole Bible. It's Luke chapter 15, and uh, we're going to look at some stories that Jesus told. He, we're going to look at two of the three today, and next Sunday we'll look at the third story, but uh, this is the story, you know, it's interesting um, how... For so many of us, our favorite story in the whole Bible is in Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son, because so many of us have had a prodigal chapter in our lives, and we relate to that. And just think, if it were not for Luke, this great physician, through whose eyes we're looking at the great physician, we wouldn't even have that story. But uh, he recorded these three stories that Jesus told. They're right there in Luke chapter 15, and we'll look at them here in just a minute. We'll read it together. But first of all, I want to give you the back story. You know, each of these stories has an intro. Each of these events in the, in the life of Jesus, the stories that he told, there was something in the background that led up to that. And today's stories were the product of, uh, you know, Jesus was, by this time in his life, he, he attracted crowds. And uh, people followed him around. They wanted to hear what he had to say. And this particular day, there was a crowd there, but it was actually two crowds. And they're characterized quite differently. They're really a contrast between these two groups of people who are there the day that Jesus told these stories. The one group was called the group of the, the tax collectors and the sinners, the bad crowd. They were hanging out with Jesus, and Jesus was keeping company 
with a bad crowd. But then there was also this really respectable, good crowd of people who were there as well. And the way that I pictured it in my mind, the, uh, the bad crowd was sitting close, maybe the first few pews here, and, and the really good crowd was sitting back there where you guys are sitting. But the, the good crowd, you know, seeing Jesus associating himself with the sinners and tax collectors, they were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And so I picture them kind of standing back with their arms crossed, and, and they ask this question among themselves, if he really knew who they were. And then the Bible says, right there at the beginning part of Luke chapter 15, they began to mutter. Well, I think Jesus heard their muttering, but we've seen so many other cases. He also knew what they were thinking. And you know what? Jesus had a heart for the guys that were sitting on the back row. He wanted to bring them in. He wanted... He made an appeal to them. And so I, I see him picturing, how can I bring them in closer? And right there on the spot, impromptu apparently, he came up with these amazing stories that we're repeating. We're going to read today and talk about them today. Because I think he wanted to draw them in. And they were standing at a distance wondering why Jesus was associated with this group. And so he told them three stories about lost people. And we're going to read that word several times as we read through this passage. The word lost appears over and over. But I think I want us to maybe redefine what we think of when we think of lost people. It doesn't mean that they're the bad people. It doesn't mean that they're the troubled people. Lost just means you're out of place. And see, Jesus knew that they were the lost people in the, that these stories represent. They're just out of place. They haven't found their place yet. Really, that's what Joe and Anna did, wasn't it? They looked at Richard and Rose and said, they're out of place. You know, they can come find their place among us. So look, if you would, let's go ahead and go to Romans chapter 15. I mean, have I been saying Romans? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I usually need somebody sitting close to correct me uh, from time to time. But this is from Luke chapter 15. And uh, we'll go ahead and put, uh, for those of you who can see that, look at it in your Bible, you can look at it on the screen, I'm going to read it from my Bible, these words of Jesus in response to the muttering that he heard from the back row. And let's read this together, okay? And Jesus told them this parable. And remember, a parable is a fictitious story in order to, to teach a lesson, to teach us something. And he really was trying to appeal to them. And this, this is what he came up with. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after? Go after the lost sheep till he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls all his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. He was out of place. He's back in his place. And I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people who do not, do not need to repent. And he goes on. He tells the second story. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one out of place. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Sounds like Kelly looking for her phone to me. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors and together says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What a great story about the importance of the ones who are out of place. They're so important that you give, we give them our first attention, even at what seems to be the neglect of the others, doesn't it? Well, you know, each of these stories appeals to, I think Jesus had in mind three different groups of people who are in the room, that, not just the, you know, the close ones, you know, the sinners and, 
and the uh, tax collectors and then the Pharisees and, and the uh, lawyers. But I think he, he knew everybody here is one of three things. They're young men, they're young ladies, and then there are parents, they're adults. And so I think what he did is come up with a story that would appeal to each of those. And his first one was for the young men. Which of you, you know, if he has a hundred sheep, because this was a very common thing for the young men to do in, in their culture and in the first century, the young men would go and, and go with the sheep because, of course, there were no fences, hardly any pens at all. And so they shepherded them. And the young boys, remember the story of David? Where was he? He was out taking care of the sheep. So the young boys, when, when, when Jesus said, which of you, if you had a hundred sheep, they go, that's me. I, he's talking about me. I know what that's like, to have a hundred, hundred sheep. And what if one turns up missing? And he talks about the priority that they would surely give to retrieving the one that's out of place. And they're all going, yeah, I get that. Yeah, that's what I'm like. I'm responsible like that. Now, I've, I've never owned a sheep in my life. And I grew up in a different part of the state. And uh, if we had owned sheep where I live, coyotes would have eaten them by morning. Just too many, too many predators. But I grew up, we had cattle. And uh, not a huge place, and not a whole bunch of them or anything, but, but we had cattle. And I guarantee you, if one of them turned up missing, we would do exactly what Jesus said the little boy would have done. We'd have gone looking for him. We wouldn't say, well, you know what? Got 24 out of 25. That'll do for now. No, it would have been inconceivable that we, we would have left the one out of place and not gone in pursuit of the one. And then he tells a story about a lady who has 10 coins. And, and re this really would be the picture of a young lady, maybe a girl, some of the commentators suggest that the ten coins could even have represented an engagement ring in their culture. And if you were to lose one of these ten coins, then it would mean that you're not appreciative of your engagement, you're not appreciative of your fiancé, maybe you're taking him less than seriously, and so this would have been a frantic search. This wouldn't have been nothing passive Oh no, I lost one of the ten coins. And so she goes to all the trouble and gives all of her energy and all her effort to finding the one. Make sure she gets the one coin. And I think the young ladies, the little girls who are anticipating their turn to be engaged or whatever, I think they were saying, well, of course you would. Of course you would go look after the one. And so there was an appeal to those two groups of people and he onboarded them so that they could understand the priority, the importance, the value. Remember, Luke's the one who talked about the least, the last, the left out, the little ones, the lost. How important those lost ones are. On any given Sunday in Del Rio, Texas, there's some folks who are out of place this morning. They have not yet found their place in a family called a church. And so they are not necessarily bad people, but they're out of place. And so any given Sunday morning in Del Rio, we are surrounded by, it's not like one out of 10, it's more like the nine out of 10 who have this, we should be able to give and we could give our same priority for it. To think of them. You know, how is it when your family gets together for a family reunion? You're so glad everybody's together. I went to a wedding Thursday in Houston and uh, it was a family wedding and, and there were some folks missing. Well, what were we thinking about? Now, we were glad about everybody who was there, and, and uh, this was my niece who was getting married. And, but you know what? All of us thought about, oh, I sure do wish Donald and Daryl could have been here. We were thinking about the ones also who weren't there, and not neglecting the ones who were around us. We really glad that they were there too, but that we would, even as a family, have a heart for the ones who are out of place right now. And sometimes the ones who have taken themselves and gone out of place on purpose. And that's what Jesus was talking about in this, these stories. He was trying to appeal to the guys on the back row, not quite sure what he was up to. And he just wanted them to know how important people who are out of place are. 
And he went on to tell these stories. Next week's story will be about the prodigal. That was the one that would have appealed to all the moms and the dads, the adults in the room. So he covered all the bases. We'll get to that one next Sunday. But as I read this story, I got to thinking about, and I probably, I probably repeat myself a lot. Well, that helps me learn maybe. That's why. But uh, just a few weeks ago, I got a text from a 13-year-old friend of mine. She's my granddaughter. And uh, I always like getting text messages and phone calls from little Aiden. And this one, I, I looked it up on my phone this morning. I wanted to go back and, and review it. And every time I kind of opened it to that place, so I was just going to read it to you. But my phone always rearranges these things. And so I'll just recall it for you. But this is what she was saying. Granddaddy, what am I going to do? I have a friend, and uh, she thinks there's no God. In fact, she calls herself an atheist. And then, in addition to that, she's, uh, she, this was when the Bruce Jenner deal was going on. She, she also thinks that she may be, how oh, a 13-year-old kid even knows what's going on, transgender. She wants to be transgender. What can I do about my friend? I want her to believe in Jesus. See, little Aiden, God has given her a heart for her friends who are out of place. Such a good example for me. Granddaddy, what can I do? So we texted back and forth a few times, and I thought, hey, your Wednesday night youth group, they go to the Lake Point Church in Rockwall. She said, you enjoy that? I wonder if she would go. And, you know, isn't this how most of us are so often? Well, we're afraid that if we invite them, that somewhere or another they will be offended. And so... We're kind of afraid to do that, and we kind of hold back. But I encourage her, I said, Aiden, just invite her to go Wednesday night with you to youth group. Oh, do you think she would? And so next day or so, I got another text back. Granddaddy, she's going to go with me Wednesday night to youth group. And I'm so glad she, she accepted my invitation. You see, in the little world that Aiden lives in, she walked across the street and she invited this little friend of hers who's just out of place in order that she may come with her and you know there's something really powerful about our personal our individual you know the words that I use to share my faith to share the gospel something really important about that but then when that is complemented by the corpus by the corporate witness when all of us stand and we sing those wonderful words to those songs. Then we complement our individual witness and friendship with the, friend, with the witness of everybody in the room. So Aiden took her little friend, her name's Nicole. She took her with her to youth group. So I was anxious to see how it went. And I texted her back, Aiden, how did it go? Wednesday night, late that night. She said, Granddaddy, she loved it. She said, everyone was so nice. And in fact, I think when they got to talking about Jesus dying for our sins, she started crying. And I thought that at the end of it, that she was probably going to go forward and tell everybody that she wants to believe in Jesus. But she had had a sprained ankle and, and she had a, I don't know, some kind of boot or something on her leg. And so as little girls are, she was self-conscious in front of people. And Aiden said, that's the only thing that kept her back that night. But anyway, the good experience that Nicole had, and just the great example is for me. Granddaddy, what shall I do? I said, well, duh, how about just invite her? And that's what she did. And that story is still ongoing and, and still progressing. She's real positive about And then she comes back with other questions. Well, of all the religions in the world, how do you know that only one is right? And Aiden's always, Granddaddy, what I... I can't believe that 13-year-old kids have these questions that she does, really thinking, and then Aiden's wanting to ask her questions, and then complimenting her own conversation and friendship with her little friend, Nicole, by inviting her to come to youth group with her. Such good stuff. Well, see, I think that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. When you know one who's out of place, what do you do? You go to them. You, if it's a street literally or figuratively, 
you walk across the street and you go in in their behalf. But you know what? Every time we do that, none of us ever does that alone. All of the times Jesus talked to us about, you know, encouraging us to share faith. Do you remember that promise that he gave every single time? I'll be with you. In fact, I think that the times that I've attempted and have done so, walk across the street, literally or figuratively, so many times I get there and I realize God may beat me there. And when I raise, you know, turn the conversation to spiritual matters, there's a connection that's already been made. And so I'm only complimenting a work that God is already doing and already beginning. And so why in the world should I be so afraid to bring God up in a conversation or turn the conversation to spiritual things? Because you know what? If he's given me a heart for somebody who lives across the street, guess where that came from? It came from him already. And so doesn't it make sense that if I walk across the street, then not only is he going with me, he's gone before me, and I can go in great confidence now, even, you know, I'm not alone. This isn't only my appeal. And the Holy Spirit himself, who has direct access to the depths of our hearts, is already there, he's already speaking. Even when it sometimes doesn't go the way that we wish. You know, we've shared two good stories. A lot of us know some good stories. Sometimes it goes a little slower than that, doesn't it? I have, I have an instance in my life right now. Boy, it's really been going slowly. And I've been trying hard. I think not doing all that badly, my part. But uh, there's some resistance that I've encountered with this one friend. And... Uh, but I'll, I'll keep on. And here's, here's, here's the confidence that I have. Even if I see resistance on the outside, I know that if God gave me a heart for my friend, it's because he has a heart for my friend. And he is in pursuit. I can even say things all wrong. I can get it all wrong and not do well and sometimes not love well. And he can still be reaching them well. You know, somebody said that God hit straight licks with crooked sticks because that's all he's got. And so it's not really even up to me to come up with the right words and do all the right things. You know, it's really his pursuit that uh, I'm counting on. So that's the story. Those are two of the three stories that Jesus told about the importance of the people around us who are out of place. We can go ahead and see that next slide. So what is the... What is the what does the house look like? Let, let's make this real. Okay, guys? What does the house look like where your friend is who's out of place this morning? And is it really all that scary an idea to think, I can go across the street, just like Joe and Anna did? And, and I can, you know, sometimes it's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? We've known these people for a long, long time, and for whatever reasons, we've just never brought up our church family with them, or much less invite them. So sometimes these conversations later in the game have to start with an apology. You know what? I owe you an apology. I've been thinking about it for months, maybe years. I've just never gotten around to it. But do you have a church family? Do you have a church home? We have this great group of people that we go and be church with every Sunday morning. Would y'all like to go with us? Would, would you go to church with us? How hard is that? Really, how hard? A little bit of risk. You know, Jesus talked about the risk. When you leave 99, you risk something bad may happen to them while you're gone. There's some risk involved. But then the value of the pursuit, putting all of your effort, that's what the second story, looking for the coin. No matter what, I'm going to find that phone, I mean coin, and I'm going to go looking for it. Anybody else lose your phones? Funny thing, my sister was walking around uh, telling me, I can't find my phone anywhere. I don't know where I left that. And she was talking on it the whole time. <laughs> oh, I've uh, probably done something close to that myself. <clears throat> what if we all just walked across the street? What if we really did? Whatever the house across the street from you looks like. What if we just walked across the street? What do we have to lose? 
What do we have to gain? That's a better question, isn't it? You know, Lifeway did some research. They do this all the time. And, uh, you know, Lifeway is what we used to call the Sunday School Board in Nashville. You know, the Southern Baptist producers of our Sunday School materials, many of which uh, we, we use here. And uh, they, they did a survey. In fact, they, they surveyed 3,000 people and they asked this question. Um, what would be your response to someone if they invited you to church? 80% said, I would probably go with them. 80%. If I got an invitation to church, I'd probably go with them. And then this, another question that survey was this for people who are already in church. Uh, of you who are already in church, uh, how many of you are there because somebody invited you? You know how many that was? 90%. And so you know what? I really appreciate Alfonso, all the work that he's doing on our website. We realize that that's the portal, that's the window through which people who are going to be moving to Del Rio, who are looking for a church phone, a uh, church, looking for a phone. I'm always like, for a church home. You know, they'll go to the websites these days, you know. And so really appreciate your help with all of that. If we could get, get us a more handsome spokesman, we would probably go further. But uh, you know, doing everything we can, you know, all the ways we can to, to invite those folks. But, uh, you know, 90% who are in churches, our churches today are there because somebody walked across the street. Somebody invited them. You know, isn't it sometimes we think there's this ominous thing. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And for some reason, we're afraid, oh, but what if they don't like me or what? But, but isn't this really what it's usually like? <laughs> What's holding us back? It's only in my imagination that I think that they may think something bad. What is there bad to think about somebody who invites another to church? How can we poorly characterize that person after all? And so, you know what? Here's what I hope. And as I was reading this story, it started last Sunday, and Lord, what's the real message that we need to hear from this? And how can we make this real and, and make this matter? See, this is one of, those, you know, one of those messages that if we all just nod and go along, and yeah, funny picture, and I, I get it, and, yeah, and then we leave, and then we just go eat, and then next Sunday we just come back, and we never walk across the street, then, you know, except for the contribution that was made by Dunamis Spirit, we've wasted our time this morning. Yeah. Each of us, I bet you, has somebody in mind right now. Somebody you could invite. Somebody that you feel like, wow, if God put them on my heart, and he must be on his heart too. She must be on God's heart, too. And so I'm going to get over whatever, you know, ominous thing that I can imagine. I'm going to walk across the street. I'm going to be Joe and Lugo. Uh, Joe, Joe and uh, Anna. I'm going to be Joe and Anna Lugo in somebody's life. And that's not start the new thing in our church. Start something new. It's bring something someone new. Some of you have already beat me to that. You're here today with a friend that you invited. And uh, so that really, that really encourages me. So I think I'm not going out on a limb all by myself. This is an idea that maybe God had in the first place. So let's do that. Are you in? Can we do that? I think we can do that. Is, is that scary? Not really. Maybe a little bit. Look at the chair. <laughs> it's all in our head. You know, Jesus told a story about the importance of the ones who are out of place. And he didn't do it just so that we would be entertained. But we would do it so that we would get him. That he cares so much about the ones in Del Rio this morning who are out of place. And so let's walk, let's walk across the street, okay? Thank you for affirming that idea with me this morning. I appreciate it. Let's pray together, okay? Lord, we do. Uh, we extend an invitation at the end of these services because we know that you're inviting people to know you, not, not just to come and sit in a pew 
or maybe be counted in a Sunday school class, but to be known as yours. And uh, we really thank you that when we were out of place, you didn't leave us there by ourselves. Everybody in this room has somebody that we can look back to. They walked across the street for me. They invited me. They invited me to know you, to know them, and be a part of a family that we call the church, and we thank you for them. So, Lord, if there's somebody today who wants to say, that's me, you're talking about me, and God's been talking to me, then we want to give them an opportunity this morning to respond, and we do so now. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen.